Well, good morning. Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> We're going to continue our study of the story of God and man, looking at God's program uh, for redemption through the covenants. And uh, our thematic reading today is Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 22. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. And by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the, the top of his st staff. And by faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and give you thanks and praise that we can come together today and lift up our hearts and rejoice in your goodness and rejoice in your blessing. Father, we rejoice that you watch over us and care for us and that you have an eternal guard on our souls, that in Christ that you have sealed us with redemption. Father, for, we just thank you so much for the gift of righteousness that we find in him, that, Lord, that we can enter in not by our own righteousness but by his, and we come into your presence, into your very holy of holies with boldness to declare your praise and to find grace in our time of need. And so, Father, we commit this time to you that we would indeed find grace today, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, so far, we have seen the creation of man and the fall into sin. And from there, we saw humanity driven into a fallen world, but not without hope. The pronouncement of the doom of the serpent and his seed by the seed of the woman implies a plan or promise of redemption. Now, we have followed the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman in the contrasting genealogies with the seed of the serpent leading to the rebellion at Babel with the result that humanity is spread all throughout the earth. Now, we've also uh, followed the seed of the woman through the genealogies of Seth, Noah, Shem, and Peleg leading to Abraham. In essence, this is the line of, the, of descent to the one who would come. The seed of the woman, also known as the Messiah, whom we know to be Jesus. Now, thinking in terms of blessing and cursing, the seed of the serpent represents the curse, and all those who reject God are identified as that seed and are ultimately the recipients of the curse of God. The seed of the woman is the means of blessing, and all those who call upon the Lord are identified with the seed of the woman and are recipients of the blessing of God. But there is a distinction to be made between those who are physically in the line of the seed of the uh, uh, line of descent to Messiah, the seed of the woman, and heirs of the blessing uh, of the of the promises. Making a distinction between those and those who are identified with the seed of the woman by faith. In other words, at this point, our focus is on the physical line of descent that leads to Messiah. But as we see, the blessing is not uh, limited to the physical line in some sense. Uh, there is a, an element of the blessing that is available to all of humanity when God tells Abraham and, and you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So we have to keep that distinction uh, when we talk about the blessing of Abraham. There is that to his, his seed and his physical descendants and that which is leading to Messiah. And then there is that which is to all the families of the earth which comes through faith. Now, in our last session, we saw God make a covenant with Abram in which he promised three main things, land, descendants, and blessing. And we noted that the promise, uh, that the land promise is inherently tied to the, the promise of physical descendants, specifically the descendants of Isaac and not Ishmael. The promise of blessing was to be both uh, blessed, Abraham was be blessed and to be a blessing, and he's going to be a blessing uh, to the world. 
Now, today we are going to look at Abraham's descendants and their descent into Egypt, which was prophesied in the covenant that God made with Abram. Now, this prophecy is an important element in the continuation of the blessing. It's very important to understand what's going on here. Genesis chapter 15, verse 13 through 16, it says to, that God said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So you see what's going on here is that in the making of the covenant, God prophesies the future of Israel. This prophetic element is very important. It's not just him making an oath. Uh, he's prophesying the, the, the course of the blessing uh, to Abram's descendants and what will happen to his descendants, especially those that are the recipients of the blessing. So let's then get into uh, the, the, this transition from, from the land down to Egypt. And we see it through his descendants, through Abram's descendants. So first we see Isaac. Looking at Hebrews 11 again, verse 17, says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now, that tells you something. That's the only one that God thinks of as the only begotten. Uh, Ishmael was not being considered there. Of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So God made it clear to Abraham that Isaac was the chosen seed, not Ishmael. Isaac would be the recipient of the blessing of Abraham. And so th this is made clear. Now remember, the reason why all this happened is because Ishmael was not the son of Sarah, his wife, but the son of his concubine. And so, or her handmaid, which is basically the same thing. Now, as we saw, Ishmael was blessed by God, right? But he was not allowed to inherit with Isaac. He was sent away. And you know, and his mom goes out there in the wilderness and he thinks... She thinks he's going to die, and she's gonna, she can't bear to watch, and then God shows her a well, and he goes and lives in the wilderness and becomes a great nation as God had promised. So God prophesied about Ishmael, prophesied blessing, but not the blessing of Abraham. So you know, Isaac, on the other hand, dwelt with Abraham as his heir, and Abraham confirmed this towards the end of his life, even though at one point God was, Abraham's like, telling God, let Ishmael live before you. Let him be the blessed one. Uh, no, he's not. I'm going to give you a different son. He's the blessed one. And Abram confirms this in his own statements. Genesis 25, verse 5 through 6 says, and Abram, uh, well, not statements, but what he did. And Abram gave all that he had to Isaac. So he's the heir. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines which Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward, away from Isaac, his son, to the country of the east. So he gave them something, sent them off, got them out of there. He has one son, one heir, and Isaac will be the only one who inherits. And we don't get a lot of information about Isaac. But we do see God confirm to him the blessing that Abraham blessed him with. In Genesis 26, verse 1 through 5, it says, There was a famine in the land, besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants I give all these lands. And I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So God confirms Isaac is the one 
that would receive the blessing. That he was the one whose descendants would inherit the land, not Ishmael. It didn't end with Isaac. Next we see Jacob. Hebrews 11, 20 says, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning the things to come. Notice the prophetic nature of the blessing as stated in Hebrews. This is important as we follow the line of descent to Messiah. We'll see some prophecy uh, in that regard in a little bit. But here we see prophecy involved even before the, the two men are, are born. Genesis 25 and 21 through 26 says, Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. Sound familiar? And the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah his wife conceived. But the children struggled together with it within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So there's the prophecy about what's going to happen to these two kids. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give her birth, to, for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. Jacob meaning supplanter, actually, or deceiver. So by prophecy, God declared the line of descent that would be through Jacob. You say, how's that? Well, this blessing goes back to uh, the prophetic blessing of Noah. What happens there? Genesis 9, verse 26. And Noah said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God, uh, may God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. So this idea of Japheth dwelling in the tents of Shem indicates that Shem is the greater. You know, you're in the better position if you're dwelling in, if you're living, in, I mean, uh, if you have somebody that you can put up. And the person that's living in your place is not in the better position, you know. So that's the problem, uh, not the problem, but this, the prophecy that is indicating that Shem is the greater and Japheth is the lesser. So the lesser serves the greater, or, or at least is in the dwelling. Now, <clears throat> we see this also in the fulfillment of the blessing that Isaac confers on Jacob unwittingly. Remember, Jacob goes in and looks like Esau, you know, uh, gets, gets his fur on and everything, and and, and, and acts like he's Esau and, and goes in and steals the blessing from his blind father. That little supplanter, that little deceiver. Well, this doesn't come out without context because remember what has Esau done? He sold his birthright for a bowl of soup because he got to have it now. Old Benny Hint. Got to have that gold now. So he sold his birthright. For a bowl of soup. So the, that's the context in which now Jacob, neither one of them are very good people. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, they're a mess. You know? But looking at it from uh, Isaac's perspective, I mean, Esau's the, the man of the field. He's, you know, he's, he's his favorite son. And, and that little sniveling wimp, uh, Jacob, staying in the tent with his mom all the time and stuff. So he's, he wants uh, Esau to have a blessing, and he's going to bless him. But, of course, he's blind. He can't see. And he says, then, then his father Isaac said to him, to Jacob, Come near and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him. And he smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him and said, Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore may God give you the dew of heaven of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and the nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who bless you. This is the blessing given to Abraham. Now, Isaac 
intended to give it to Esau, despite the fact that he had taken a Canaanite woman as a wife, and, or several, a couple of them, I guess, and that in spite of the, the fact that uh, Esau had sold his birthright, he still intended to give the blessing to Esau. But God had other plans. And so the blessing was conferred on Jacob, who himself has some character issues, as we mentioned. Now, Isaac recognized the legitimacy of this conferral later on in Genesis chapter 21, uh, 28, verse 1 through 4. It says, Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. He should have had that attitude about Esau. Arise, go to Padan, Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. Notice he's still a stranger. They still don't have the land. They're just wandering around in it. They don't own it. Who owns it? The Canaanites. They, it's so much so that they have to actually have to buy some land just to bury. You know, Abraham has to buy just to bury his wife. And they don't actually own the land. They're just free grazers. You know, back in the day in the West, you had that. You had people that owned land, but they couldn't put up fences. They just had to allow, you know, cattle and, and sheep and everything to free graze, and that's where some of the land wars came in. And people start putting up barbed wire and everything. Wait, wait, you can't do that. Well, there was a lot of free land to graze on, what little grazing you could do back then. Uh, and, I mean, it was probably in a little bit better shape than it was in the last, you know, 2,000 years since they got kicked out. But nevertheless, they uh, didn't own the land. They're still strangers in the land, but he is getting the blessing. He is going to get the, the land, and he, but even though he's still a stranger in it at this point. Now, notice the repetitive elements, the land, the blessing, multiplying, and so on, because it is the same blessing given to Abraham. And then God confirms that the blessing belongs to Jacob when Jacob encounters God on his way to Padan Aram. Genesis chapter 28, 11. So Jacob came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in the place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending. Boy, we could say a lot about that. But. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The, the land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There it is, the blessing of Abraham to the nations. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. So God confirms that the blessing that Isaac gave to Jacob was legitimate. It was given, and it's given by prophecy. It's, and this is, God is prophesying here what's going to come in the future. Now, of course, there's a lot of work to be done on, Laban, I mean, on Jacob, right? He's a mess. <laughs> His name is supplanter or deceiver. And he is what he's named. And so God's got to fix him up. And God's got a plan. He's going to send him to old Laban. Now, Laban is a worse deceiver than Jacob. I mean, think about it. In Genesis 31, 7, Jacob complains to his wives, Laban's daughters, about their father. He says, you're, yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not allow him to hurt me. You know, there's a, there's a little lesson in that story. What's your sin? Be careful, you might meet somebody just a little bit worse than you. <laughs> you know, it's like the, the prideful person. What's the one person that drives them nuts? 
the prideful person. <laughs> you know, it, 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 you notice another person's ego right away when, when you got a lot of ego. It just like bumps right into yours before you can get through the door. You know? So be careful. God may use somebody else that's just like you to rub you the wrong way and show you what you are. And I think that's what he did with Jacob. I think he let Jacob see what he was, what this supplanting and all that stuff is about. And so after leaving Padan Aram with his new wives, the, son, the daughters of Laban, and the children that he got through them and through his, you know, their handmaids and all that, Jacob once again encounters God. But this time, Jacob exit, exits the encounter a changed man. Genesis 32, 24 through 31 says, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And God said, let me go, or he said, let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name no longer shall no longer be, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over the Peniel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Now he's a changed man. How do we know he's a changed man? Had a new name. And remember, his name identified who he was. Well, now his name identifies, what does Israel mean, prince, uh, prince of God? Is that what it means? I forgot to look that up. I don't remember. Uh, it's, it's something like that. Yeah, prince of God. And, uh, and so he has a new name. He has, um, you know, the blessing confirmed. But how does he leave this encounter? Broken. He's broken. And notice what it says. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. I, 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 I'll let you catch that when we read it. But he leaves that encounter broken. He's a changed man, but you don't encounter God, you know, walking on two feet and come out the same. You're going to be broken somewhere. God is in the process of breaking every individual, whether it's our pride our rebellion, our, our fleshly lust, or whatever it is, he's in the process of breaking it. I can, when I dated a woman way back in the days, it was not Dea, a long, Dea, long time ago, uh, I really was struggling with a lot of pride. You say, wow, you must have been really bad. <laughs> as much as you got now, you were struggling back then? Well, it was worse, and, and so I was struggling with pride, and I, and I just kept, praying and talking to God about it, and, and I mentioned to her, just, just like, I just got all this pride in me, and I'm just struggling with it. She goes, what are you talking about? I don't, I don't see that. And, and then one day we got in an argument. I see that pride you're talking about now. <laughs> yeah, it comes out at those opportune moments sometimes, right? But God had to break that in me. And he had to break. I mean, I, it, was, it was a breaking. I know you've had your experience, too, of being broken before God, if you're in Christ. And God is in the process of breaking us. And, and Jacob leaves this encounter limping, broken man. Now, this gives us some really good insight into the distinction between Esau and Jacob. Both were sinners, of course. But what was Esau's attitude towards his birthright? He despised it. No big deal. You know? He would rather satisf satisfy his immediate longing. Just got to have that donut, you know, or whatever it is you're longing for. That moment, for him it was a bowl of soup. Man, that must have been some good soup. Goodness. 
Whataburger must have made it. No. <laughs> that is, he, he, he wanted that soup so bad that he literally is arguing, I'm going to die if I don't eat right now. You know, your eyes got that syndrome. I got to eat. I got to have this. I got to satisfy this. And I don't care about anything that comes afterwards. I got to live in the moment. Well, what is Jacob? I mean, what's he do? How, what's his attitude towards the birthright, the blessing? I mean, he's already got the birthright. But that birthright ain't going to do him any good if he doesn't have the blessing of God. You can, you can inherit whatever you want, but if you ain't got the blessing of God, it'll go. But what's his attitude? Where do we see his attitude expressed? Huh? Yeah, in the struggle. He won't let go. He won't let go until what? You bless me. I'm clinging on. Even if you break my hip. In other words, he's willing to be broken in order to get from God what God wants to give him. He is willing for that to happen because he wants the blessing of God. He wants God. Now, he wasn't pursuing God. He was pursuing a wife. God's pursuing him, uh, you know. But when he encounters God and he knows the blessing is at stake, he is not letting go. And God says, you have struggled with God and men and prevailed. He prevailed how? Can he win a fight with God? No. How does he prevail? In faith. God tested him. God said, I, I, you, want it? you want it this bad? Crack. There goes your hip. You still want it? <laughs> he didn't let go. He wanted it. He prevailed in faith, believing and trusting God. See, Jacob pursued the blessing of God at great personal cost. Cost. Now Esau was a disdainful man. He didn't care about all that. He didn't care about that. He wanted. To, he didn't want to go to church on Sunday morning. He wanted to go do whatever he wanted to go do. He's not interested in that. Well, then once again, God comes and confirms the blessing to Jacob. Genesis 35, 9. Then God appeared to Jacob again, and, he, and when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him, and God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel, and God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. A little preview there. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and to your descendants after you I give this land. So here again we see the emphasis on the land and the seed. There's a little new element added, and that is that kings will come from your body. But all seems well to this point, right? Everything's going great. They're in the land, but there are strangers in the land. But they're in the land. But don't forget the prophecy of the covenant. They're not going to stay in the land. They're going to be moved out of the land for 400 years. And we see that in the story of Joseph. Hebrews eleven twenty one 21 says, By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. Now, remember that brokenness? What do we see in this text? What is it telling us in this text? When it says that he worshipped leaning on his staff, what does that mean? He's still a broken man. He still got that brokenness. He carried it with him to the day he died. When God breaks you, it's a permanent thing. But it's a good thing. It makes you depend he worships in dependence, leaning on his staff. Makes you depend upon God. Now, Joseph plays large in this narrative. He is, in fact, a type of Christ, a deliverer, if you will. And I would love to get into all that. Uh, I've done a sermon on that, and it's really cool when you get into all that. Uh, but 
we, we <laughs> this is try, we're trying to skip a lot of material to get the overall flow of the story. So uh, we had to see that first uh, he is sold by his brethren into slavery because they hated him. They just hated him. He was a snot. They didn't like him. He, you know, had the dreams that were prophesying true things about him. They didn't like. And, and this is all part of God's ultimate plan to bring the whole nation into Egypt. They sell him uh, into Egypt uh, or to the, to the traders and they, he gets carried off to Egypt. And, and guess what? He uh, is down there for the rest of his life except for when he buries his dad. And, uh, and so Israel and, and uh, his sons are hanging out. The rest of his sons are hanging out there as strangers in the land. And then famine hits. Once again, the famine. We saw famine with uh, Abraham. Here's famine. This time, though, God appears to Jacob and tells him to go with his sons down to Egypt because they've gone down for food and discovered that Joseph is down there. And so, uh, you know, through all the planning and, and, and all the, the little trickery of Joseph, and he reveals their sin, and they realize all this has happened to us. This guy's crazy, and he's, mis he's abusing us. Or, you know, we're getting caught at things we didn't do uh, because of what we did to our brother. They recognize their sin. They come to the realization of their sin, and they are saying, all this is happening to us because of that. And, and so uh, then Joseph reveals himself. He brings uh, Jake, uh, Jacob, Israel, down into Egypt, and God says, go down there, and they live there. For 400 years. Now I think there are two reasons that God sent them to Egypt besides the typological value of them being slaves delivered from bondage. First, it allowed them time to grow into a great nation so that they had the numbers to take the land when they returned. They needed to be mighty, a mighty army to fill the land up and subdue it. Second, and Hindenburg pointed this out, uh, and I think he got it from somebody else, but uh, he points out that this kept them from intermingling with the Canaanites. If they had stayed in the land, they would have been just all mingled up with all these people. How do we know that? Because Judah took a Canaanite wife. And so God sends them down to Egypt where the Egyptians abhorred the Jews. Why? Because they were shepherds. And, they, and you see in the story of Joseph, at one point they're all having a meal in three different locations. You got the brothers over here, Joseph over there, and the Egyptians over here because they can't eat together. So they all eat, not, they might be eating the same food, but they ain't eating in the same place. And, and so the Egyptians would not defile themselves. You, you, I, you always think of the, the Jews being that way, but the Egyptians were that way long before. And so they would not defile themselves, so God moves a whole lot of them down there. And guess what? They don't intermarry with the Egyptians because the Egyptians don't want them. And so they grow and and into this mighty nation, and, and then God delivers them out. And he's got a big enough army to march them over there and take the land. Now, one final thing we need to note concerning this whole descent into Egypt, and that is the, the prophecy concerning the sons of Israel. See, at the end of his life, Jacob prophesied over his sons. And... We have particular interest in the first four sons. We don't have time to get into all of it, but, but the first four are particularly interesting in, in regards to the line of descent to the seed of the woman. Let's read Genesis chapter 49, verses 1 through 12. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what, you, what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Man, it sounds good. Reuben's, in fact, wasn't it, was it Reuben or, Reuben or Simeon that tried to save Joseph? I'm trying to remember. Simeon, okay, never mind. So Reuben sounds, that sounds all great, but then he says, unstable as water. You shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Remember, he uh, uh, slept with uh, uh, Bilhah. And so uh, he's, he's not going to excel. In other words, he's just been set aside. 
He's not going to be the recipient of the blessing. He's not going to be the line of descent. He's not even going to be really considered the firstborn in, in, in that sense. Simeon and Levi are brothers. That's the best thing you can say about them. <laughs> Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their counsel. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they ham hamstrung an ox. This may be in somewhat related, some way related to the Dinah incident. We don't know. Uh, probably the slaying of man is, but I don't know about the ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So, not, not much blessing there. They're not going to get the inheritance. They're not going to be the line of blessing. What about old Judah? Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Wait just a second. Didn't Judah do something bad? What did he do? Yeah. But you know what is interesting? Is that when he was called out, he didn't deny it. And he even said, you know, Tamar, his daughter-in-law, who was played the, the harlot, he didn't know it was her. Uh, he went into her, she conceives and all that stuff, and, 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 uh, and then he gets called out because she had the signet ring and all that stuff. Well, what does he do? No, uh she's lying. Right? Is that what he did? No. He said, she is more righteous than me. He humbly confessed his sin. And I think, if I remember right in my reading, I, 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 I think it was Judah was the one that said, this is coming on, on us because of what we did to Joseph. And so here's a man willing to confess his sin, acknowledge his sin. And so, yes, he was a sinner just like them, like the other ones. But he was also repentant. Remember, there are only two kinds of people in the, in the world, the thieves on the cross, the repentant thief and the unrepentant thief. The first, two seem to, the first three seem to be unrepentant thieves, and Judah seems to be a repentant thief. He's a, he's a repentant man. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows, he bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rise him, rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than, whiter than milk. There's that last part has a lot to do with blessing, probably. The, the key part is that he is a powerful uh, man, and he is going to be the one to whom the, de the scepter is given. He's, in the, he's, he's going to be the one who is going to have the rulership, and he will uh, be the lawgiver until Shiloh comes. There's, there's probably a reference to Jesus. Uh, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. So th this is a preview or a picture or a prophecy of the line of descent to Messiah. So we see then now Judah singled out. Now there's no more singling out in this sense that from this point on. There's going to be a line down to David. Uh, but I don't, I don't think there's any other specific... Uh, statement. So at this one, it could be any ones of the sons of Judah. If, I, if I'm, you know, I don't think there's any other narrowing down. Now, so we, in this prophecy, we see this line of descent from the from the from the perspective of a throne. Now remember what, what what Isaac said to Jacob: "Kings shall come from your body." Well, this is the first time that we see the throne. In other words, when you look at Genesis, there's not a whole lot about kingdoms and kings and stuff. Uh, and a lot of times people make the, the whole of the Bible all about the kingdom of God. But it didn't really look that way in Genesis. It begins to develop here. 
We're beginning to see the idea of the kingdom. Remember, we saw the establishment of the state through capital punishment. Now we're seeing that, at least in the, in the context of the, the nation Israel, who is going to be the legitimate ruler, and through that, who is going to come and be the final ruler who is going to sit on the throne in the Messianic kingdom. It will be one of uh, Judah's descendants. So we're progressively learning more and more about God's plan. It's not just to doom the serpent, to curse the serpent, and to cast everyone into hell, except for a few that, you know, that come through the specific physical line. No, it's that, that God's plan is to redeem the world, to redeem the planet through the one, the seed of the woman. And he's going to bring him into, into a kingdom and make him king. He will indeed be king of kings and lord of lords. So any theology, in my opinion, that, that negates this idea of the kingdom of Christ, that says that, well, Jesus is reigning right now on the throne, uh, and he's just going to come back and take us all to heaven. You know, there's, no, there's no kingdom coming. You know, nonsense. Nonsense. Jesus, Jesus was humiliated on this earth. You think he's not going to come and reign on this earth? I mean, he was brutalized and hung on a cross. Oh, he's going to go hide in heaven and reign from up there. No. He is going to establish the kingdom. He's going to rule and reign on the throne in the millennial kingdom. It's just a matter of time and a matter of figuring out the timing of the various events, but it's going to happen. Now, how do we apply all this? Well, there's lots we can say about our hope in the kingdom and stuff, but I want to talk about something that's a little bit different. I want to talk about the fact that our actions matter. Now, Esau sold his birthright and couldn't get it back. Reuben's sin cost his descendants their right to the throne. Same with Simeon and Levi. Our sin will cost us greatly. We're not going to get away with anything, guys. Sin will have its eternal cost. Whether that means that you're eternally lost in hell or you eternally lose reward. You know, when you're sinning, you're not working for the Lord. <laughs> the only way to earn reward is to be in the Spirit and let God do the work and work through you. Everything else is just work a straw. This is going to burn up and be gone. You're going to suffer loss. And when you're all about building your own kingdom or, or going out and satisfying the lust of your flesh or, you know, doing all that stuff, it's going to have a real cost. Sin will... As, they, as the saying go, cost you more than you want to pay, keep you longer than you want to stay, and hurt others along the way. And I think Brian used to have one more he added to that, didn't he? What, do you remember what it was? No. <laughs> I don't either, because he's the only one ever I heard say that one. I heard the other ones from everybody else, but yeah, it takes you one further than where you want to go, yeah. Yeah. So the point being that Sin is destructive, and we see it in the lives of these uh, descendants of Abraham, even though they're getting the blessing, even though they're part of uh, the blessing that God gives Jacob. All 12 sons are part of that blessing. They partake of those blessings, but yet they're, and you go on and read more, Dan's a mess, you know. There's a lot more of them that, that are messed up. See, our actions matter. What we do matters. No, that was Simeon. No, I wouldn't look. Because I thought it was Judah too. Oh, okay. Well, Simeon, no, Simeon came back and found him. I went and looked at it. But, no, 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 no. That's Bible study, brother. We can have Bible study in the middle of a sermon. I don't care. You know, because I certainly don't want to get it wrong. You know, as Carrie, Carrie Tuller said one time, uh, and they and talked about Jesus on the cross, and they broke his legs. And a little old lady come up uh, after the cross, I mean, after the 
sermon and said, you know, read the, read the verse when it says, and they did not break his legs. And I was like, oh, I don't, he, he just made a mistake in the way he said it, but, you know, but, or maybe the way he remembered it, but we don't want to make silly mistakes, you know. We don't want to get no, uh, Moses in the ark and all that kind of stuff. We're going to do it, but it's okay to think about these things in the moment, but we do want to apply it. We want to apply the, the, the fact that our actions matter. But you know what? Our attitudes also matter. See, ordinary sin, just regular ordinary sin, has ramifications. It's not really just ordinary sin. You know, Jacob had that. Judah had that. All of Abraham's descendants had that. It's a problem of attitude in regards to sin. Because Esau's attitude is, he don't care. He's, he, doesn't, he's, he doesn't even care that his birthright's been sold. He probably thinks that he's going to get it anyways. And he certainly thought he was going to get the blessing. But Jacob, on the other hand, was willing to pursue God. He saw himself apparently the way God saw him. You know, God, yes, you're Jacob, you're a deceiver, just like your old Uncle Laban. You're just like him. Now... I don't want you to be a deceiver anymore. I want to change you who you are. And Jacob's okay with that. And that's the difference. You know how many people will not come to Christianity because they don't want to be changed? They don't think they have to fix it for God. Some of them do. They don't want God fixing them. That's the root problem. You don't want God fixing you. You know, whatever your problem is. Whether it's attitude or you know, beliefs or, or, or sin or whatever. No, God. I don't, uh-uh. But Jacob wanted the blessing and pursued it. He prevailed in faith. See, everyone sins, but where do you go from there? Second Corinthians chapter 7, 10 says, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. We see that in Judas he was sorry that he, that he betrayed Jesus with worldly sorrow. He went out and hung himself and then somehow fell and split open. He, he, his sorrow led to death, not repentance. He didn't go to Jesus or the disciples and confess his sin and ask to be forgiven. He just killed himself. Your attitude makes all the difference in how you... And what you're going to get from God. Blessing or cursing. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. And we thank you that you truly want to bless us. It is your desire to give us the blessing of Abraham through faith. Uh, that, as you said, in him all the families of earth shall be blessed. And we know that that blessing is appropriated by faith. And so, Father, we, we know it's your desire uh, to bless to save. You, you don't desire that uh, any should perish, but that, that all should come to repentance. You take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But Lord, you want to see us saved, and you want to see the world saved. You want us to go out and share the good news with those around us so that they might receive the blessing by faith. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to see where we, in our attitude, Lord, are either repentant and pursuing you for a blessing or we're unrepentant and fleeing you into death. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd work on our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen.